Hello and welcome to Pest in Class, expert voices in pest management. Today I talk with Brianna Nearland, the operations manager at Quick Kill Pest Control located in Madison, Wisconsin. We discuss processes that create efficiency, the perils of DIY pest control, and how sometimes you have to walk away from a job. I'm your host, Amanda Salvatore. Let's get into it. Brianna Nearland, you are the operations manager of Quick Kill Pest Control located in Wisconsin. Thank you so much for coming on to Pest in Class with us today. Of course. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to get into it with you. But first and foremost, we very often start our episodes with a bit of an icebreaker. And I know you are a scuba diver, mm -hmm. which I find wildly amazing. I think that's great. So what is the most interesting thing you have seen while you were scuba diving? Oh, well, there's not much scuba diving in Wisconsin, as you can yes. probably <laughs> imagine. <laughs> um, so we kind of use it as an excuse to be able to get to the Caribbean once a year or a different place that we can go diving. Um, eagle rays are always my favorite. I love eagle rays. I was on my first ever dive trip to the Caribbean, actually, and it was our last dive. I was with my brother and they'd been seeing these eagle rays and I have never, never seen one before. They've been seeing them at one dive site. So I told the dive master, I said, if I don't see an eagle ray, I'm never coming back to this island. And we were on Cayman Brac. Hop in the water, there's four eagle rays. So They heard you. They, they did. <laughs> they did. And so it was really cool. They kind of just hung around us and they just, they fly and like glide through the water so amazingly. Um, I was hooked. And actually I have an eagle ray tattoo on my foot. I, I had to get it because I was just, I, I just love them so much. They're just, every time I see them, I'm like, an eagle ray, yay. I love that. I yeah. love that. They are really beautiful. And I, I did go to back to Brack too, because I did see the eagle rays. So nice. we did make it back. You kept, you <laughs> upheld your promise. Yes. And that is amazing. Exactly. So let's get into it. Mm -hmm. Tell our listeners how you found yourself in pest control. Always such a low question. We're a second generation family business. So dad started the company. I graduated high school and went to school actually for biotechnology. I worked in pharmaceutical microbiology for five years and I just hit my wall. I mean, five years in an industry at 25 is way too early to burn out, but I loved the work. I, I loved what I was contributing to, but I didn't love the environment. I didn't love the kind of people that were involved in that environment for me. And I realized it wasn't going to change. So I approached my dad and brother and said, hey, I think I want to join this family business. And that was hard. I mean, it, it was not an immediate yes. And when I when they did give me the yes, I started as a technician. And people are always so surprised to hear that I was a tech. I was a service tech on the road for three years full time. And then I slowly started transitioning into the office. And I just loved it. I fell in love with it. I loved the work. I loved being a tech. I'm so valuable in our office now, but if I can go just hit the road, I will. <laughs> um, and it just, it captured my heart. And then I got involved with all the industry stuff and going to conferences and meeting more people and the the openness of the industry. And I'm, I'm never leaving. I'm stuck. Yeah. I'm here forever and I'm happy about it. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. What about working as a tech really spoke to you? Helping people. There's a hero factor there. It doesn't matter if it's an ant that somebody's freaking out about or a bed bug. It's, it's an intrusive feeling. Something's in your home. We are a primarily residential company. So homeowners are scared and they're freaking out and you get to come in and save the day. I actually have a quick story on that. But when I was a tech on the road, it was like 9 a.m. My brother calls me. He's like, I have this lady and she's just freaking out. She saw a mouse in her kitchen and she's freaking out. And he's like, can you put it on your schedule today? And I'm like, well, yeah, but I'm not gonna be able to get to it until, you know, 2, 3 p.m. He's like, that's fine. She'll wait. So I call her when I'm on my way. And she's like, yep, door's unlocked. I'm on the kitchen table. I was like, what? She's like, just walk on in. And sure enough, I walk in and she's sitting on her kitchen table. She saw a mouse run across her kitchen floor and she, at 8.45, 9 a.m. when she called the office, and she didn't leave that kitchen table all day long. And mice work. I'm not going to go 
find that one mouse and get rid of it. You know, I'm going to do my exclusion. I'm going to set my stations and my traps and, and we're going to move on. Didn't have full peace of mind by the time I left. I at least got her to a chair. Good. <laughs> so it's like, hey, we're off the table. <laughs> she wouldn't put her feet on the floor yet, but she's she was on a chair at least. And that one really resonated with me because I was like, that's that's the importance of what we're doing. We are providing such a peace of mind for our clients. And being a tech on the road, like you get that full hero factor when you're the one that goes out on site. And it's just, it's so cool. Now you've made this transition to operations manager. And I know that you are a big advocate for efficiency. So let's talk routing. Mm -hmm. Why is it such a top priority for you? And how can a business optimize the process? Routing is what runs your business. You can have everything else be super efficient, but if you're not running efficient routes and your guys are zigzagging across town all day long, all that other efficiency went out the window. So it really starts there. And I think that that's just, it's so beneficial to make sure that you are as efficient as possible and automating anything is always a good option, but also utilizing your software, utilizing the tools that you have in your hands. It doesn't have to be anything crazy and complex. You just have to find what's work works for you and what's also scalable for you in your business. And something that goes into that is, you know, making sure you have proper client expectations on when they expect to see you show up on site as well. And are you going to call ahead? Are you not going to call ahead? Are you going to have an appointment? Are you going to get inside? There's so many other factors that go into that. So use your software, utilize that, make it efficient, but also make sure that you're setting good expectations with your clients so that you're setting yourself up for success on that. Do you have any tips for someone who is interested in communicating with their customer and letting them know when they'll be arriving and how they'll be arriving? What are some tips and tricks that you utilize? So we maybe are not the normal on this. We don't call every client before we come out. We let them know that they can expect to see us first week of the month, second week of the month, whatever that might be, between the first and the seventh, as an example. We let them know they'll see us at that time, and we roll with that. And that's that's just the expectation that we set with them outside only, unless you have concerns. And then if they do want the inside treated, they just give us a call. And if they do want to call the day before to know we're coming out, we have that all automated so they can get that with the email or text message, whichever way you want to set it up. But it really comes down to knowing your values and what works best for you, the area you're in, the pest pressure you're dealing with. I'm in Wisconsin. Our pest pressure is very different than the South. And I understand what works for us might not work for people in higher pest pressure areas. But we know our values and the service we provide and we fully believe in it. And we know we don't need to get inside every service. So we don't want to have to do that. And we don't want to put more material down than we need to and everything. So it is, it's setting your expectations with clients, but in order to do that, you have to know who you are and what works for you and your programs. Could you tell me a bit about the values of Quick Kill? Our values, so personalized service is gonna be our first and foremost. We have our set programs. They are not customizable. We don't let our clients dictate when we'll be out but we still make sure that every client feels like they're getting that personal touch from us. You know, that's from knowing their dog's name or that they have a cabin up north that they like to frequent, hobbies like scuba diving, you know, finding a way to connect with the customer. I think that that's a, definitely the most important and immediately following that is gonna always be quality, right? You wanna have a high quality service that you're providing. On top of that being a family business, family is a value. That one gets a little bit of debate sometimes. Some Not everybody has a positive family outlook. You know, we weren't all raised in a, a perfect family. Not that mine's perfect, but <laughs> some people have a negative connotation with it. So team is right there with it. And we use those interchangeably because we don't want a team member to ever feel like, oh, family. Well, I don't really do the family thing. But yeah, personalized service, quality service, that family feel, along with being prompt, respectful, you know, all those good values, but knowing who you are too and sticking to that, hiring on that, firing on that. You live and die by your values in business. Yeah, sticking by your values and, and really 
taking that and using it throughout yep. the business and letting it guide the way. How else do you keep your culture and that feel that, you know, it's not my dad, brother, myself, and our first couple team members out servicing homes anymore. We've all elevated. So how do you keep that feel as you're hiring new people in? It's by hiring on those values and holding people to them. I want to talk a little bit more about operations and efficiency because I know that's something you're very passionate about. So is there any other processes that you've put in place that has really set the tone for your company? Oh, so many. Um, <laughs> anything I can automate, I love to automate. Um, I think the biggest automation that I did was for our collections though, financial holds and collections. You're not doing well in business if you're not getting paid for the work that you're doing. That was actually one of the first things that I automated and it was a game changer. And if people hit that financial hold with us, they don't go on financial hold till 75 days. But once they do, they get noticed. They have automated phone calls, they have text messages, they have emails going out and nobody wanted to make those calls. Who wants to call and make that collections call? Nobody wants to do it. So now we have our a couple of our CSRs, we have a financial holds level one and level two and they manage their parts and they still call manually once a week but otherwise they're getting like three the clients getting like three calls a week and we don't have to touch it and they usually go on their customer portal and pay online and then we just run that audit and all right we're back out for service now because you're paid up and give them a call to realign service expectations payment expectations if needed but yeah i love that efficiency like if it's something people don't want to do, find a way to automate it. <laughs> I love that idea. Make it easy. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about a pet peeve of yours. <laughs> DIY pest solutions. Yes. We know them well, and we've all heard the horror stories. Mm -hmm. but can you go into it a little bit more? You want my horror story? I Absolutely, <laughs> yes. All right. Well, Termidor, we all know Termidor, right? Very common product for us. I was a technician on the road and I showed up to this gentleman's house and I'm doing my inspection. He has ants. I'm doing my inspection and I'm looking around and I see this white residue all over his baseboards. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, something's not right here. So I asked him what it was. Well, I don't know, something I got off the internet. I'm like, in order for me to be able to provide service, I need to know what material this was. And so he goes, digs into his recycle bin, and he comes out with an empty jug of Termidor. He used the whole thing? I looked at him. Oh, no. I looked at him. I was like, how'd you mix this? And what did you apply it with? And he goes, mix? He took concentrated Termidor and applied it inside around his baseboards. Now, the only reason why I can think of that he still had ants is because it took care of them before they were able to get that material back into the colony. I had to walk and I was in my mid twenties, looked like I was 17. And this little girl, when everybody expects, you know, the bug guy to come out, right? And he just looked at me, he's like, what do you mean you can't provide service for me? I'm like, sir, I'm like, you need to read the label. This material was applied completely illegally. And I said, I can't put my name on this account, on this address that, with that happening. It's my license is on the line with that. That was a turning point for me. And I tell people that in our new hire orientation, it's a story that I like to share with people in the industry because they're always like, oh my gosh. Yeah, concentrated Termidor on the baseboards. Oof, that is wild. How did it feel walking away? from that. Very often people great. are, this, it, it felt great. <laughs> great. I love that great answer. I wanted my name tied nothing to that. I mentioned I came from microbiology, pharmaceutical microbiology, FDA, European Union, EPA regulated. I was not shy to audits and regulatory coming from that world. So I saw that and I, I knew better. So yeah. it felt good to walk away. I didn't want anything to do with it. I am so pleased that you did that. Very often, I think you can get into a sticky situation because you think the customer is always right. I don't want anyone to be upset with me. I don't want to upset this customer. And you really stuck by your values and made sure that you were taken care of as well. If I lost my license, I lost my livelihood. Yeah. I was a tech on the road. That was my position. Not that you ever want to lose your license, but being in the office now, 
you know, might be a different story, but I still would walk. (laughs) But yeah, that's my livelihood. You can't put that on the line and let somebody else dictate that for you. I want to thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. Brianna, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to talk about too? Just to elaborate a little bit on that DIY. I know I told my story, um, but it's something that really resonates with me. Every time I see that concentrate in a client's home, it like sends a little chill up my spine. It's really comes down the pipeline and it does affect us as PCOs too. We're licensed, we're certified, we're we're professionals in our trade and we're the ones that are regulated. The homeowners aren't regulated. So when they can openly buy these materials online, not read the label, misapply them, now it's starting to cause issues elsewhere affecting endangered species from misapplications or whatever it might be, that comes back on us. We're the ones that get dinged because we're the ones that can be regulated but we're not usually the ones that are doing it. I don't know any of my contacts and colleagues, at least, that would put their license on the line. So I think it is a topic and industry that's maybe not talked about enough. Yeah, what do you wish people talked about when when they talked about DIY? I wish we just had more. I don't expect everybody to hire a professional service. That's not realistic. Ideal, but not realistic. I just wish we had more, like, maybe middle-of-the-road options mm available that does hold some accountability to the homeowner. If they're doing it themselves, if they have to buy it already mixed, that would be a great one. Or separating our products from what they can access and not just go onto any number of online platforms and purchase. Um, You know, I think about it, hair dye, at least in Wisconsin, we can't buy the full professional grade product unless you have that cosmetologist license. But I can go get a middle of the road product that's between the premix box and, you know, the professional grade. Why don't we have that same thing in our industry? That's a great thing to think about. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on today and talking with us about operations and DIY. This has been a great episode. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.